Hello everyone, this is Bobbin Threadbear, and welcome back to Sleeping Dogs. Now, as you can see by this here map, there are a bunch of new cop quests out there. Well, cop jobs, I should say. Sort of the wrong genre to have quests. Also, there's this uh, yellow event out here in the corner. When they're not favors, they're events. That still gets you favor experience, plus whatever special rewards it has. Anyway, these all appeared since the since I did the last story mission. So I could continue the story, or I could go uh, find out what these are all about. Guess what I'm doing. Go on. Guess. You know, I should change my outfit more often. I will start changing my outfit more often, but for now, we're stuck in the same uh, tank top and track pants. Okay, we're going to stop a vehicle and... Oh, hey! <laughs> you know, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to, um, you know, park my car in such a way to actually um, stop the suspect more easily. But I'm kind of glad I did. I mean, I do have to catch up with him now because I uh, kind of got turned around there. But uh, yeah, I, I got to uh, inflict a lot of damage. Oh, oh yeah. I just found the, uh, the horn button. Oh. I only had to catch up with him. Hmm. It's not over yet. Alright, but perhaps you've noticed, but Wei Shen is not in his usual outfit. He is in a uh, SWAT team tactical outfit. Now, aside from any sort of outfit bonuses you get, cop outfits have a couple of differences that you may have been noticing. For one thing, instead of the normal uh, grapple punches, when you grapple someone, uh, you use a taser. Also, if you press the grapple button twice, got him in custody. you uh, put them in handcuffs and throw them to the ground instead of knocking them out. The advantage is that you can arrest someone when they're at low health. Instead of just, uh, oh Jesus, dude. Instead of knocking them out completely. So that didn't have much cop experience, but I did get a decent amount of money. And that SUV. That one I was just driving to disable the suspect vehicle. Executive is one of the best Class B uh, cars in the game, by the way. Didn't really know that when I picked it, but... Uh, it's really fast. We got an AR in progress. Is there a tactical unit available? PTU on route, please stand by. All right. Now, me and a bunch of police guys are going to beat up a street full of gangsters. And you can see I am starting out with a police baton. Which is good because they're starting out with a bunch of weapons. Down he goes. Yeah, I, I stole this guy's um, meat cleaver. Because that's what a responsible police officer does. Grabs a criminal's meat cleaver and uses it on them. But hey, at least I'm arresting a couple of these guys. All right, one last group of these to go. By the way, that's the running strike. You can also do a running tackle if you use the grapple button. That's not entirely useful yet, but one day it will be. Under arrest. The cleanup crew, not 
Yeah, I'll bet. Ooh, full cop experience. But again, not getting much of it. But I do get a decent payout. And that outfit I was just wearing. Alright, one last cop job. Let's go see what this is all about. I think this is long enough that I should probably cut the, uh, the drive over. Heavy gunfire reported. All PTU, please respond. Hmm. PTU on the way. Thank God you're here! Nobody back down! Come on! You said heavy gunfire, but they're all wielding weapons. And by weapons, I mean blades. And once again, Wei Shen has swapped his baton for a bladed weapon. Man, that, that did not last long at all. Do not resist. That was not what I expected starting my patrol. Thanks for your help. Sweet. What do I get this time? Oop, full cop bar. Not much experience, but the same payout and the HKPD motorcycle. That's a Class A motorcycle. Much better than the one I've got. Speaking of fast motorcycles, what's this high speed all about? Let's go find out. Uh -huh. We are going to stop a street race the hard way. In a cop coupe. Now luckily this isn't a cop mission. So it's not actually going to dock me points for running into stuff. So my strategy here, by the way, is going to be to race for the winners. Because if I manage to... Oh, I guess I do have cop experience for this one, even though it's an event. And yeah, I kind of killed someone, so that's a ding. But yeah, see, once you get ahead of them, it's easy just to slow down and wait for them to catch up. I mean, this game does have some pretty thorough rubber banding AI. I mean, you can get ahead of them and stay ahead of them, like, way ahead, but then at, at the same time, like, if you get behind them, they, they slow down to, like, street-legal speeds. Alright, what have we got left? Looks like three guys. Alright, 60% of the race complete. So have it. Ah, oh, damn it. I think I sent this guy going the wrong direction. The, uh, the little flares indicate where you're supposed to go. And this is not it. But I, I kind of knocked the guy onto the highway where he shouldn't have been. And now he's... He's, uh... The AI didn't quite know what to do there. But, yeah. Well, only a quarter of the race left to go, and I just spent a whole lot of time chasing after one guy who was going the wrong way. But, like I said, rubber banding does work both ways, and I should catch up to the, uh, the only two guys left. Or is it just the one? I guess it was just the one. Kind of amazed I still got two shields out of that. And it's quite a lot of experience, too. Oh, and I, I got the heavy-duty SWAT uniform. The one with the body armor. Alright, nothing left to do but, uh, but the, uh, the regular mission. Oddly enough, they, they left me in the cop coop. Um, 
that just happened. I'm not sure what just happened, but it was kind of neat, and I got 30 meters of airtime. <laughs> okay. My man, away! You done good. You restored order to the night market. Well, you took a chance on me, Winston. I wanted to make sure it paid off. You got the right attitude. It's gonna pay off for you. You'll see. You know anything about the minibus racket? Well, same as everyone. If you want to drive a good route, you pay the toll. That's right. You know the pickup on Marble Drive? The most profitable route in the whole fucking city. From now on, it's yours. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it, Winston. <laughs> Dog eyes, Walt. Right now it's his route. But you know how to deal with it, huh? It'll be my fucking pleasure. I gotta take this. Take a few of the guys with you to back you up. Let's go. What's going on? We're going on offense. Taking over Marlboro Drive. One man per stop. Anybody gives you shit? Fuck them up. Smack them around, no killing. What, afraid of little blood? Dog eyes his son on ye. We're taking the route, not declaring war. You can ask is fine by me. Alright, sounds like a plan. And we get to drive a bus. I'll take this one. Good job. Yeah, kick his ass. What? It's only a mini bus because it's only got one layer. Wait, hold on, gun. How come we're going after Dark Eyes? Shouldn't we be fighting 18K? Dark Guy came after us? This is payback. Pain and simple. What if Dark Eyes complains to Big Smile Lee? What if he sends Mr. Tong after us? Look, dude. Dark Eyes might work for Lee, but Winston has just directed Uncle Todd. Nobody's going to fuck with each other. Nobody. Hey, you have a pay. This is our stop now. And we're gonna beat you. By the way, the reason the Sun on Yi here are able to uh, have so much infighting without having to worry about 18k, which in real life they're 14k, which makes a little more sense. Alright, the guys in the gray uh, wife beaters are mine. But the reason is that 18k is a lot smaller than Sunan Yi. Sunan Yi is the biggest gang in Hong Kong by far. At least the last time I checked that. Alright, you can with your fist. I'll give you that. Thanks. Yeah, we have another guy with us a while back. He was good with his fist too. Came out of nowhere. Good story. Didn't talk much. You remind me of him. A lot. Turned out he was a cop. That's why he couldn't kill anyone, see? So now we know how to spot a rat. You talk about. You know that? You know what they do to traitors, right? When Tong is done with them, he buries them alive. Six feet under. Nobody coming for you. Hey, fuck you, Conroy. I still think about that poor fucker sometimes. Y you know, cops are still allowed to defend themselves, right? They're, they're just not allowed to murder people. There's a distinction. That's why homicide is a class of crimes. Not, not just one. But yeah, they're, they're not allowed to initiate the idea of killing someone. But if someone points a gun at them, they can do something about it. Let's go. No, 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 you stay here. I'll deal with this. Watch how a real man does it. Son of a bitch. Wait, you better get them. Oh, someone else is trying to apply the route. Hey, you. You want this route, you gotta pay for it. Belongs to Winston now. Winston? I don't know no Winston. Pull over and I'll tell you about it. You're wasting my time. How about I break your legs and see how you... Okay, okay, I'm going. Well, that was easy. Get out of here, I'm taking your passengers. Okay, okay. There's a slight problem with your bus, so we're doing a change. And the, the guy is ordinary, but he does not want to get in the middle of gang bullshit. Don't worry, people. After a quick change of drivers, 
Damn it. Oh, great. Hang on. You can't drive this way. Who the hell are these guys? Let me off. I don't want to be a statistic. Don't worry. My yeah, you, you, you really can't escape the bad guys in a bus, so I'm trying to slow down to, you know, have them come up next to me so I can ram them. But they aren't really cooperating. They're, they're kind of keeping, you know, level with my speed. What the hell, guys? I thought you actually wanted to stop me. Low speed chase. Exciting. <laughs> Come on. You can do better than that. Jeez, finally. Oh, passenger satisfaction bar just appeared. Interesting that it, it didn't exist during the ambush, but now that it's over, um, you can piss the passengers off. Here we are, people. Uh, this was probably the most exciting thing that happened all week. You are driving the Sim Sam Shuangu, are you? All right. Oh, what? That sure looks like a full triangle. What the hell? I think that message from, uh, what's his face, uh, was about, uh, Tran Deliveries. Uh, I can now accept Tran Deliveries, which is where I steal a car and bring it in. Conroy? Well, I guess he's the second in command, that's why he's so distrustful. It's his job. Yeah, I see Tran there. Yeah, hello? Amanda, it's Way. You doing anything later? Magistrate Park. You want to come along? Yeah, cool. See you in a bit. Meet me at Victoria Peak. Yeah, that'd be fun. See you, away. All right. It's a date. And it's pink. Hey, what can I do for you? Let's go in style. And here are the new cars, by the way. But yeah, once you connect with a lady in the main plot, you can go on a date with her. It's really just the one, though. There's not much follow-up, but that's because Wei isn't looking for anything serious. Wei! Hi! Hey, Amanda. You look frustrated. What's going on? It's closed. Why is it closed? The public is only allowed in on the weekends. Oh, this sucks. I wanted some pictures for my blog. Hmm. Well, let me see what I can do. Yeah, you can do this at any time after you meet her. You know how I was talking about writing a book? Yeah, with your photos, right? Yeah. I decided to do it on all those cool little shrines all over town. She's talking about the health shrines. Oh, oh, can you take a picture here? Alright, this time someone's supposed to be in the photo. Looks good, thanks. <laughs> you know, I have to say, that dress looks really good on you. Well, you know, this guy bought it for me. The guy bought you that dress, huh? Tell me about it. Well, he's pretty cocky. A bit of a jerk. But he's also kind of cute. And what does the guy think about you? I don't know. I hope he likes me. Well, I don't know about the guy, but I think you're pretty cute. I think she's talking about Way. You think you can let me and my friend in? No, I told you he's closed. Look, I'll make it worth your while. Hmm. Well, sir, it is time for my break. I think I'll go for a walk. You're so resourceful, Way. 
I think that's like 120 bucks. Hey, will you take some pictures for me? Please? Alright. Pretty straightforward mission. Oh, over here. Nothing much to it. Just this. Bunch more times. Oh, that's pretty. Hmm. Not my favorite composition. But I do certainly like you. If I can. Uh, I think this is a good oh, this one is a locked lockbox. So now I get to show you um, how to pick a uh, number lock. I'm a little too far there. Oh, a little too far there again. Yeah. This is how to screw up picking a number lock. But yeah, it's pretty simple. You just stop when the uh, when the indicator tells you to stop, then start spinning the other way, then stop, then other way, then stop, and then you're you're good. Good composition. Eh, better. But can't really look for miracles on a camera phone anyway. Really? That pose? I think that's flattering. That's great. Thanks. You're a pretty good photographer. Ah, no problem. My pleasure. That was great. Thank you so much. I can't believe you got us in here. That's ah, no problem. I mean, it was fun. Kind of, you know, nice playing tourist in your own town. Yeah, I can see that. Thanks again, though, for taking the time to, you know, do this. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, was this, like, a good date? Sounds good to me. What do you think? Definitely. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, thank you for the date, then. So, hey, I have an idea. Oh, really? Tell me more. <laughs> I wonder which car they used. Alright, finally up to level 4, now I got a car valet, and health shrines appear on the, on the mini-map. Hello? Ah, hello Mr. Shan, your vehicles are all good to go. Give me a call if you need something. Yeah, that's the benefit of uh, dating ladies in this game. They make collectibles appear. Now, the bright collectibles are ones I've already found. So there's a bunch of lockboxes and cameras from when I was doing all that. Health shrines are dark, because those are the health shrines I haven't found. The ones that Amanda just revealed for me, because um, because she's writing stories about them and she passed the information along. Also, car valet. Pretty nice. If you are near a road, the car valet will bring you a car that you select when you go to pick up a car at a parking lot. And let's see... Okay, so according to this, Amanda has been sleeping around with a whole bunch of Chinese people. But you know, that's fair. That's fair. Like I said, Wei isn't looking for anything serious either. The only reason there's any information about her is because he's gotten somewhat close to her. Anyway, I'm going to go find all of the health shrines now. All of them. Today's film is a request by patron Adam C. And its name is The Miracle Fighters. Like I said last week, it's a fantasy kung fu film, making it a little unusual compared to the other movies I've covered so far. But you can't really appreciate Hong Kong Kung Fu until you've seen just how crazy the wires and special effects can get. The story about the story. I've mentioned before that Hong Kong cinema had a resurgence in the post-war period as part of the boom that the colony went through as it shifted its focus from being a trading port to being an industrial center. The industry then went through a steady decline thanks to oversaturation and too many low-budget copycats, 
But during the 80s and early 90s, Hong Kong movies went through another major boom. There were several factors responsible for this new golden age. Just to name a few, there was a new wave of cheaper special effects and computer editing, an increasing demand for martial arts movies in other countries, the rise of home video players and thus direct-to-video movies, and a new generation of actors and filmmakers who had grown up within Hong Kong's movie industry and were ready to start pushing boundaries. Boundaries that were weakening as censorship laws were relaxing the whole world round. Sadly, the Golden Age would not last through the 90s, but that's a story best left for another day. Instead, let us now shift our focus to one particularly successful family of filmmakers, the Yuans. The family's patron, Simon Yuan, started out in Chinese opera as a Wu Shen, a martial actor who specializes in acrobatics, show fighting, and was thus the direct ancestor of kung fu actors. And for Simon, that's true in a literal sense. Simon moved on to films in the post-war period, when he was 36, and he was in several of the most famous movies to make the jump across the Pacific. You remember Mystery of Chess Boxing, right? The first movie I reviewed? You remember the cook who would only let the protagonist eat if he could grab a single grain of rice? The cook whose name was Master Yuan? Yeah, that was him. He was also the mentor figure for another young punk named Wong Fei Hung in a certain movie called Drunken Master, which starred a certain up-and-coming actor named Jackie Chan. But now, let's move on to the next generation. Simon Yuan was the father of 11 children, and half of them followed him into the Hong Kong film industry. The most successful of these kids would have to be Yuan Wu Ping, who either directed or choreographed the action sequences for a lot of movies even Western audiences have heard of. Wu Ping directed Drunken Master, and that was the second film he ever directed. Aside from making Jackie Chan's career, he's worked with Sammo Hung, Donnie Yen, and Jet Li. He choreographed Fist of Legend, and The Matrix, and Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon, and Kill Bill, and Kung Fu Hustle. Even if you don't know his name, you know his work. But, back in 1982, back when Yuan Wu Peng's career was only four years old, he and two of his brothers, Chong Yan and Yat Cho, worked together to create a, uh, a sort of a trilogy. The stories and characters are all different, but all three of them are fantasy kung fu comedies. The first to come out was today's film, The Miracle Fighters, and the Wans followed it with Shaolin Drunkard and Taoism Drunkard. The success of Drunken Master had created something of a fad. Incidentally, Yuan Wu Ping is remaking the Miracle Fighters right now in collaboration with another familiar name, Sui Hark. It comes out on October 1st, 2017, under the name The Thousand Faces of Dunjia. So that's something to look forward to, assuming it does well enough to get English subtitles in a Region 1 re-release. But until then, there's only one version of the story. The movie begins in A.D. 1663, just a few years after the start of the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Emperor and all the ruling class are Manchurians, who had conquered the failing Ming Dynasty, and as Manchurians, they are keeping themselves separate. Manchurians are not allowed to marry and have children with the Han Chinese, Han being the majority ethnic group of central China. However, Cao Hong, the martial arts instructor of the massive Eight Banners Army, has disobeyed this order and taken a Han wife. Since Cao is a national hero, the Kangxi Emperor, the greatest emperor of the Qing Dynasty, offers to spare his life if he kills his own wife. But he doesn't, so the Emperor's men kill her. Cao kills the men to go to her side, but before he can think of harming the Emperor, the Sorcerer Bat jumps down between them. And that is Bat in English, by the way. You'll see what I mean. The Emperor orders Cao dead, and so the Sorcerer teleports in a sake urn. Oh, no, this is China. I should probably call it Miju. 
And besides, the urn doesn't have any Miju inside. It holds a man, painted white, who wields a paper broadsword, and sounds like a child, and is very hard to kill. Kao doesn't defeat the urn so much as he disables it and runs away, and after killing some more guys, he stumbles into the prince's room and holds the boy hostage so that he can get away. Kao escapes to a beach and lets the boy go, but then he discovers that he held the kid's necklace so tight that the prince died. So yeah, that's one hell of a way to start a movie. Fourteen years pass, and now it's A.D. 1677. We watch a couple of old Taoist priests, a man and a woman, bicker with each other as they play tricks with fire magic and pay their respects to a shrine. A shrine featuring a picture of Simon Yuan, who had died three years before his sons made this movie. There's a drought going on, so the old man priest uses his skills to predict the weather. When he finds out it'll rain in the next couple of days, he heads down to the nearest town square, completely embarrasses the Taoist priest who's already there, and he performs a ritual in public so that he'll be able to take credit for the rain. He then embarrasses the younger priest some more, using a combination of camera cuts and stage tricks. And just to build some more goodwill with the crowd, the old man tosses back the other priest's offerings. As the rain pours down, we cut over to a young man running errands for an older man. The older man gets triggered when the young man talks about miscegenation laws, so we know that he must be Cal. Cal has become a broken man, not good for anything except drinking. When he stumbles into a few soldiers and insults them, they return later that night, sneak onto his house, and use the old eastern assassination trick of cutting a hole in the roof and running a few drops of poison down a wire into his food. But before he starts eating, Cow notices a couple of dead flies in his food, so he splashes some of it onto one of the hiding soldiers, and a fight breaks out as more soldiers literally burst in through the walls. During the fight, the young man comes to Cow's defense. And then one of the soldiers notices that he's wearing a distinctive jade amulet that used to belong to the prince. Believing him to be the prince, the soldiers retreat to avoid killing him and to report what they discovered to Sorcerer Bat. Cow and the boy also retreat to another location, but Cow got hit by some powder during the fight and it's eating away at his face and eyes. Cow demands that the young man leave him behind, and he does so, but he promises to get him some help as he goes. The boy then happens upon the temple where the two old priests live, and both of them mess with him because they think that he's a thief. But the boy clears that up, and he realizes that the two priests are at odds with each other, and so he flatters the male priest until the old man feeds him and gives him some medicine. As Kao applies the medicine to his eyes, we finally learn the boy's name, Chu Gun. Kao found him abandoned in the woods, and then raised him and gave him the jade amulet as a way to repent for the prince's death and conceal what he had done. Kao yells at Shu and demands that he go, but he does so because his past has caught up with him and he doesn't want Shu to get killed in the crossfire. But it's already too late. Sorcerer Bat shows up and uses shadow magic to disable Shu. Bat then confronts Kao, but he doesn't listen when Kao tries to tell him the truth. The two then fight, and Sorcerer Bat proves that he's named after the flying rodent by flapping around while making squeaky noises. Anyway, Kao dies in front of Shu. Shu is still disabled when Bat brings him to his quarters and notices that he's missing the seven-star mark on his foot that the prince had. But Bat isn't one to let a little thing like that stop him, and he tattoos the mark onto Shu so that he can bring him to the Emperor as the missing prince. Shu likes the idea of being a prince, but not the fact that Bat killed the man who raised him. We then get an extended sequence between Shu and the living urn that the sorcerer set to keep an eye on him, and while the urn manages to stop Shu at first, Shu then convinces the creature inside of it that it's some sort of a freak and he then escapes when the creature gets all emotional. We cut back to the two Taoist priests who are practicing for a sorcerer's championship held every ten years in the Demon City. Or at least that's what the subtitles call it. Shu shows up looking for help, and the priests argue with each other over who will get to help him. It gets rather murderous, 
But luckily, it turns out that the woman priest's oversized axe has a trick groove built in it. During the fight, Shu winds up bowing before their shrine, so the priests decide that they'll both help him, if he can prove that he's worthy of joining them. And the way Shu does that is by asking them to put off the test until later, so he can act as their disciple in the meantime. Shu asks the woman priest about the urn creature, and she explains that it's a creation of evil magic, a stolen child who had been corroded, corrupted, and controlled so that it stays in the urn and does its master's bidding. Shu then insults the woman's magic, so she gives him a demonstration where two people in a hold attack him. Except it's one person, upside down. Except it's her upside down, as the upside down person. You can see in the cuts when the people go from live action to dummies, but it's still a pretty clever sequence. Meanwhile, Shu learns from the male priest how to read ancient texts while sitting on a chair of nails. One day, Shu gets sick of the two priests bickering and tries to leave, but at that very moment, Sorcerer Bat shows up to collect him. Shu tells him that he'd rather stay put, and Bat retreats, since he knows that he can't take on both priests simultaneously. Instead, he sends his minions to do the poison wire trick on the old man while he's sleeping. But the old man snores so hard that the poison sprays up into the assassin's mouth instead. Another minion dresses up as a woman to catch Shu and the old woman off guard, but she knows what's up immediately and makes a fool out of him with some cat's cradle tricks and a sneeze. Sorcerer Bat knows he has to try harder now, so he puts on a disguise to look like the old man priest. When the old woman is alone, Bat enters her rooms and throws a drill top that goes right into her brain. But as she dies, a bit of her hair floats through the window and over to the old man. So when the old woman comes to his rooms, he's immediately suspicious and manages to avoid Bat's trap. The two get into an old-fashioned kung fu fight, although it's one with more arms and legs than usual because Shu is magically hiding in the old man's robes. And then it gets weird. The last phase of the fight is a flying sword duel, but after Shu cuts the wire to Bat's sword, the sorcerer retreats. As the old woman lies in state, both Shu and the old man are having trouble dealing with what happened. But Shu says that he'll fulfill her last request. So the old man tells him about the competition in Demon City, a competition that Shu will now win in her name. The competition begins, and King Yan, ruler of the underworld, lays out the rules. The would-be master sorcerers must pass three obstacles, the first of which is a key to their shackles placed in boiling oil. Shu gets it by creating a third arm and letting it boil down to the bone, but then he has to fight the other sorcerers to unlock his shackles. But a second sorcerer with hair covering his face gets the key and breaks his shackles too. A sorcerer who keeps trying to kill Shu. The second obstacle is a set of paper bridges strung across a pit of snakes. Shu tries to get across by using paper butterflies to reduce his weight, but then the hair sorcerer cuts half of the butterflies off and attacks Shu directly. The stilt battle they get into is pretty creative, and in the end, the hair sorcerer falls into the snake pit while Shu gets across. Shu is the only sorcerer to reach the final obstacle, which is basically a very violent and dangerous ceremony that ends with him getting the supreme command, if he's worthy. He passes the ceremony, but just before he can take the Supreme Command flag, the Hair Sorcerer jumps out of the snake pit and interrupts him. And he reveals himself to be the Sorcerer Bat, because who else would it be, honestly? I have to figure he's been trying to kill Shu because being the Supreme Sorcerer is more important to him than retrieving a fake prince. Shu and Bat get into a fight using a combination of magic and martial arts and Bat paralyzes Shu using knives that pin his shadow to the ground. But Shu farts at the light source, making it waver enough for him to get free. Bat's next trick is illusory doubles, but Shu identifies which one is real because only one of them casts a shadow. 
Bat pulls out a bunch of his drill tops, so Shu does the old woman's upside down trick to confuse Bat and headbutt him in the balls. Finally, Bat desperately grabs the Supreme Command flag, but since he didn't go through the ceremony, King Yan's dragon kills him instantly. Shu brings the flag back home and presents it to a painting of the old woman which is now in the shrine. But as the two pay their respects, the old woman grabs the flag and bursts through her own painting. Turns out she knew Bat was an imposter too, and she faked her death so that Shu would go compete for the Supreme Command. But when the two old priests play rock-paper-scissors to decide who gets the flag, Shu throws scissors to their paper, grabs the flag, and with its authority he demands that the two stop fighting. And with that, they both have to admit that the kid has some serious potential. The Style Bet you weren't expecting this section to show up for this movie, were you? But I'm not going to limit myself to martial arts stunts, not when I could cover so many other topics. So for today, style means genre, and in particular, the genre of wuxia. At its heart, wuxia is basically just Chinese fantasy, but saying that does oversimplify things, plus I still need to justify making a segment out of this. How about I start with a name? Like every other Chinese word with more than one syllable, wuxia is a compound of two words. Wu is the same wu that's in Wu Shen, the martial actor, and it represents the military and the ability to fight. Jia is a bit harder to pin down, but hero and adventurer are decent translations. Thus, wuxia literally means fighting hero. But like the word fantasy, there's more to it than that when you put it in the proper context. Wuxia heroes are similar to the old idea of the chivalrous knight errant, but there are a few distinctions. Eastern fantasy heroes can be lowborn, not the equivalent of a knight. And when they're lowborn, they don't end the story by being knighted. Now obviously they wouldn't be knighted either way, since China doesn't have knighthood, but they don't have to become rich or part of the imperial bureaucracy or army either. What they do have in common with Western fantasy heroes is a personal code of honor and justice. They fight fairly, or at least more fairly than their enemies. They always keep their word. They never back down from a fight, and they only retreat when victory becomes impossible. They stand strong for the sake of the little people, righting wrongs and carrying out justice, because the government is either too weak and distant, or too corrupt to carry out justice. However, since this is a Confucian society we're talking about here, loyalty to the cause is held as a higher virtue than protecting the innocent. On the other hand, many wuxia heroes follow some very non-Confucian ideals. These include individualism and a love of glory that's stronger than the love of money. When a wuxia hero demonstrates loyalty, it's not unconditional, it's not blind. They demand respect in kind, they challenge their relationship, and they will not hesitate to abandon an abusive master. Shugan is a classic example of a wuxia hero. He doesn't have a drop of highborn blood in him, and the only reason he was mistaken for such is because his father figure raised a foundling as atonement for his greatest mistake. When Sorcerer Bat tells him that he could be the crown prince if he plays along, he's tempted for a moment, but he quickly and without any outside intervention changes his mind because the death of his father figure is more important to him. When Shu becomes a disciple of the Taoist priests, he puts up with a lot of their antics because that's just their way of teaching him. But when they make him a prop in one of their fights, he puts his foot down and threatens to leave. When he joins the sorcerer competition, he always obeys the rules and wins against a rotten cheater because he's good enough to win honestly. And while he may not have struck the final blow, Shu wins the duel against Bat through a combination of wits, martial arts, sorcery, and a respect for the gods, which Sorcerer Bat lacked. And also the well-timed use of lowbrow humor. A fart on its own isn't that funny, but a fart that saves your life. Now that's comedy. 
Thanks for joining me again for today's film review. I hope I'll see you next time when I review a modern Hong Kong crime thriller featuring Donnie Yen, a Vietnamese gang, and a whole lot of kicking. <laughs>